question for Amaron Energy. You said the uh, half ton uh, per hour, uh, half ton per day, is it the output? No, I'm sorry. That is the uh, dry basis feed input. So for creating biochar, the focus was, the focus was on making biochar. What percentage of that would be resulting in biochar? It's probably 650 degrees or so. So, yeah, so it would depend on the particular feedstock, but you'd be looking at, uh, at that temperature, maybe 25% our weight basis mm -hmm. of, of that. Okay, great. And any... Uh, and so that would scale up. So at a 20 ton per day, it'd be uh, you know, five tons per day. Thank you. Mr. Uh, and I got a few questions, but as follow-up to that one, what's your anticipated ROI on the 20 tons per day? Uh, <laughs> if uh, we, we can talk to you maybe offline okay. uh, on, on that, if you have any Tom is right behind you yeah, there, sure. a business development yeah, guy. But, yeah, we're, we're planning, you know, we've done pro forma work and we're planning to be successful with our ROI in a short period of time in 2014. Okay, but we can talk about one. Uh, for Tom, I was curious, it looks like your auger is fairly small. Is it particle size limited for what you can feed into that? That's a uh, one thousand pound per hour unit and the particle size for that is about three quarter minus so we use a pretty small chip to run through uh, through that machine and then it, but it's it's uh, airlock uh, that's it's the airlock is the limiter usually that um, that's a 10 inch pipe and then with larger systems the pipe goes up to you know 20 inches and sorry for Brian um, very cool work as the uh, cooking charcoal made from the human waste and you having any issues with that adoption that green, those are green charcoal pellets? That's a very good question. There's an open uh, question about odor and from that perspective drying is an odorous process. Biochar can potentially address some of the odor reduction issues there. If you go with a low temperature of pyrolysis, you know, 300 to 450 Celsius, you're going to have some aromatics and some volatiles remaining in the system. Mm -hmm. So at those temperatures, odor can likely be an issue, and I think you know we're gonna test that, but we, we're expecting to have some issues there. At a higher temperature of pyrolysis, if we exceed five to 650, then we're expecting odor to be far less of an issue. So from that perspective, it's gonna be temperature dependent, and we'll probably guide our pyrolysis depending on the target markets for the output biochar. Any issue with adoption and burning those for food? Uh, so the question is, uh, issue on adoption for burning those for food, uh, that could potentially be an issue. In fact, our initial agricultural markets are non-food crops. So in fact, the very first markets are flowers and cotton, things of that sort. But over time, I think the perception will increase that you know, we're going to actually be doing pathogen measurement on the biochar, and we're expecting zero, zero, zero. <laughs> so we'll be at the public in the, in the back. So I'm wondering if, you, if you're selling your units commercially, and if they have, you are, how much they cost, and then secondly, if uh, rock dust powder is part of your single source. <coughs> That's uh, that last question. Um, I'll be willing to share the basis of the secret sauce, but there's spices that you can add on your own, and uh, I, I think that that is an interesting one. Uh, rock dust. Um, there's there's a lot of things that you can add to char um, to create some uh, pretty interesting material, some pretty interesting end products. Um, and, and again, like I showed in that last slide, m maintaining a a very tight relationship with your consumers <coughs> will help guide you not only to what you may find to be interesting, but what they may find to be interesting. So that is part of how we develop our market appropriate recipes. Commercial distribution? Commercial distribution. Um, Jeff, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> okay, so, so as, as you saw, you know, I, I mean, I was hiding nothing in those pictures there. Um, you know, the, the technology functions, um, but it's not nearly as clean and perfected as what some of these other gentlemen. So we are open to selling the technology but it's, it's not um, per se on the shelf for anyone to step up and get it. It, re it. it requires a little bit more personal relationship for a sale of that particular technology. Now the price of that technology, the 1500 model, is gonna come in at around 250,000. 
a 2200 model, probably about 354. So it's, it's not nearly as fine-tuned as some of the other options out there, but the price point is a little bit more achievable than some of the other options out there. The 1500 model is about 1,000 pounds per hour feedstock throughput, which we found to be variable depending on the feedstock. We've, we've achieved significantly higher and also significantly lower, but that's the average. The 2200 model, a ton and a half, three, I think it's 3,000. I believe the 2200 model is 3,000 pounds uh, feedstock throughput per hour, and typically about a 15 to 22 percent uh, biochar yield, depending on the feedstock and the operating temperature. And the operating temperature, which I forgot to mention as well, is is controllable. We also have a PLC and uh, several controls. Uh, typically, those kilns run best at about five to 600. <coughs> 550, 650 is, is more often. Um, bunch of hands here. Um, let's start with, I think I saw you tossing your hand up quite a bit earlier. Um, question Can you Brian. stand, please? Thank you. Question for Brian. Um, do you have any problems with um, uh, any uh, processing any parasites or other macro uh, fauna in the uh, material you receive? And has anyone looked at the potential health benefits of reducing the macro? I uh, saw so last part, uh, potential health benefits of reducing macrofauna. Yeah, the parasites and things like that. Right. Uh, so the, at paralysis temperatures, we're expecting very quick uh, extinction of all, uh, all the pathogens in the system. We are measuring the pathogenics and also the microbiomics of uh, the input material so we can actually characterize the uh, pathogens that are in the input stream. And then we will also be testing, of course, the path, any pathogens, for any pathogens in the output. Uh, but at temperatures, even approaching 300 Celsius, that will be completely wiped out. The, perhaps the most recalcitrant organisms are helminth eggs, which at a temperature of 130 to 160 Celsius become uh, inactivated. So from that perspective, uh, we expect complete inactivation at torrefaction temperatures, much less biochar temperatures. Um, and in the back. A point and possible opportunity for Brian. It seems that one of the newest and wealthiest cities in the world has no sewer system. Dubai, uh, which also has the tallest building in the world, the George Khalifa, uh, uh, that building is not hooked up to a sewer. And in that city, there are miles and miles of tanker trucks loaded with sewage that are waiting to offload their product into ships. I don't know where the ships take me. But, uh, but in a country that needs water. Very far. Okay. Not very far. <laughs> uh, so you have that, that resource of all of those tanks, uh, trucks full of uh, human waste that uh, could well benefit from the kinds of things that you're doing. Right. No, I think that's a very key example. You know, sewers worked fine in London in the 1800s. But we actually had this problem right here in Massachusetts. I grew up in Cape, on Cape Cod, and Cape Cod has now managed to eutrophy their estuaries to the point where it's completely untenable. The EPA is coming down and said, this isn't going to last. So it's a crisis on Cape Cod because to actually uh, hook everyone up to the sewer ends up costing forty to $60,000 per household. Compare that to a $6,000 Phoenix composting toilet, urine diverting dry toilet perhaps, and you're looking at an order of magnitude and material cost plus installation. But now if we can create a urine diverting dry toilet where we're not adding water to a moisture problem and we're not, you know, the scalability of these sewage systems are a problem right here in Massachusetts in addition to being a problem in a desert like Dubai or in a dry country such as the countries in Africa and elsewhere. So we fundamentally have to quit adding water to a moisture problem and at the same time why not use this as a great fuel source for doing biochar at, at the same time that we're achieving sanitation objectives. So from that perspective, rethinking the toilet makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, right. I, uh, is there Can you stand, potential please? for adding other fuel stocks into the stream? Because you think your drawing problem could be hugely alleviated by wood chips or wood, uh, other things that might be readily available. Definitely. A adding fuel stocks is the question. And I think that is an enormous opportunity because we've actually looked at environments ranging from 
uh, Kenya and Uganda to NASA, where we've actually been working with NASA Ames, and they have uh, some interesting similar problems on the space station, and NASA Ames has done some very good characterization of solid waste. And they said, look, we've got excess green waste and excess uh, cardboard and all sorts of other combustibles. Every place we've looked, we've had green waste and other materials that could go along with the human solid waste. As a result, that combination, finding that right mixture, uh, ends up being very key. We want to see how far we can push those moisture levels. By the same time, our yields of biochar increase significantly when we add green waste or other feedstocks to the system. So from that perspective, a hybrid feedstock, an omni-ingester, if you will, and an omni-processor that can dry, pyrolyze, and generate biochar, we see that as a key opportunity going forward. Brian, I, I'll, I'll get you in the back, but I want to say, um, when you have them ready, uh, I have my phone as well. <laughs> um, in the back. Yeah, I uh, fabricated a rotating drum kiln, so you guys are my dream team. And uh, I had, I caught the attention of the local fire department really quickly when I ran this thing. So my question is, uh, can you speak to the seals between your rotating parts and your stationary parts? Okay. I'm just going to. Now, obviously, that's that's a significant challenge. So early on in our development, that was something that, that we addressed. And we were able to come up, and I, I can't really give you a lot of the, the details. It's, it's somewhat proprietary. But we were able to come up with a high temperature rotating seal that actually functions quite well. And we've been using it now for uh, over two years and, and haven't had any trouble with it. So there, there is a way to do it. And our system uses a screw auger, and so we're able to just use uh, high temperature uh, bearings. And uh, Ron? I'd like to ask Brian, moist material is often considered for hydrothermal carbonization, HCC. Could you talk about that? Yeah, the question is about hydrothermal carbonization. And while from a sanitary perspective, it's likely to be able to address most pathogens, especially in a pressure cooker environment, where you can exceed temperatures of 130 Celsius. One of the significant issues of hydrothermal carbonization from a permanence uh, biochar standpoint is that there's a question of how, how permanent the carbon is if it's been hydrothermally carbonized. And so that's one of the key issues as we go forward uh, is uh, it's attractive to go with hydrothermal carbonization. But if the objective is not only uh, sanitation, but also uh, carbon sequestration or permanence, uh, then it could be more of an issue for hydrothermal carbonization than it would be for, say, a traditional uh, slow pyrolysis system that would generate biochar. Yeah, I have a question for the gentleman from Anaron. What is the projected cost on your uh, commercial unit? That's the one. The other one is, uh, do you know Pacific Pyrolysis in Australia also has a rotary kiln unit or used to have one? Uh, what's the difference between this kiln and theirs? Okay, two interesting questions. Uh, to, to the first one, uh, again, maybe we can talk offline. We certainly understand our costs, but uh, anyway, we, we'd prefer to, to, to maybe talk to you offline about that. With regard to the Australian unit, uh, I, I don't know the, the specifics of that, that unit, so I don't know that I can distinguish between uh, ours and theirs. I don't know, it, it, I presume it's indirectly fired? Yeah, so I guess I'm not being very helpful, am I? Excuse me, on price, can there at least be an order of magnitude range? Sure. I, mean, I can maybe address that. One of the things that's key with the technology, actually Josiah hit on it, um, for the kilns and things, the reason we'd like to talk offline a little bit is each customer has unique needs for their feeding, and actually a lot of your price and cost can go into the automation of the system that you need for your site. So, you know, you want to talk ranges or whatever. Um, Josiah actually had some pretty good numbers for the big technology, but they can get expensive the more elaborate you'd like to be with additional condensers or additional feeding methods. But, you know, typically like, you know, a 10 to 20 ton per day unit, we're, we would range in prices anywhere from, you know, 300000 up to a million dollars. But it would really be dependent on that customer that's interested in what suits them the best, if that makes sense. But the rotary kiln, uh, you know, we have experience with pyrolysis for the, these types of materials, but we've been 
utilizing rotary kiln for many other applications, and those costs are fairly well known for us for what it would take to simply apply our technology at a certain scale. But depending on the site-specific requirements, the mobility requirements, it's uh, it can be very unique. Um. <coughs> For the guys that have systems deployed in the U.S. and Canada, what are the emissions um, kind of uh, thresholds or breakpoints and any issues surrounding those? Uh, it's state by state. Um, and in Hawaii, we're below the threshold. And that's um, established by what? BTUs? Or? It's established by BTU. Um, now, suggesting with many years of experience beyond mine in this, perhaps we, you can answer that better. Like Utrazai, we use a thermal oxidizer, which is uh, rated best available control technology by the EPA. And so that takes all of the long carbon chains that are the beautiful syngas and tumbles them and, and pulls them apart and turns them into CO2 and water and a tremendous amount of heat. And so we're uh, with wood, there's just, there's really no emissions. It just goes, turns from being long carbon chains into relatively much less inert CO2 and water. So, so because these processes involve combustion, uh, you know, there are going to be regulations on the various uh, criteria pollutants and even, you know, so we're talking about some of the waste, there are other issues with regard to VOCs, products of incomplete combustion. But uh, these, a lot of these units are small enough that the mass emissions, and most regulations are even normalized by BTUs, but are on a mass basis. So many of them are small enough not to be considered a major source, and so they may be exempt. So it just kind of depends on the particular application, the, the size, and then looking at specifically what's coming out. So in general, with the combustion, you would expect to have complete combustion if it's designed well, but you still have to look at the trace pollutants, the NOx, and, and VOCs, and so forth. 